Looking up at the moon at the night sky has often served as inspiration for creative artistic expression. And in the field of planetary science, creative thinking is often needed in generating hypotheses to test towards understanding the origin and evolution of the solar system. Hello, this is Steve Larson, senior staff scientist at the Lunar and Planetary Lab, University of Arizona. I started my career in 1963 as a first year work study student and have been fortunate to work for several well-known planetary scientists over many years continuing to the present. It was a magical time of transitioning from ground-based and telescopic laboratory studies to in-situ exploration of planets and the moon. Back in the mid-1950s, Dr. Gerard Kuiper was the director of the Yerkes Observatory in Williamsburg, Wisconsin. He foresaw human exploration of the moon as part of the space race of the 1960s. He also realized that some fundamental work was needed before astronauts could safely walk on the moon. At the time, for example, scientists were arguing about whether the moon's cratered surface was the result of impacts or volcanoes, and whether the dark Mario were formed by lava flows, and whether the soil bearing strength was even strong enough to hold the spacecraft. Uh, so on, on this crater on the left, the Elegante crater in the Pinacates, northern Sonora, is actually a Mar crater, which is an explosion caused by hot lava encountering groundwater, not an impact. Uh, the upper right is a breach cone uh, that is all lava. And that motley group in the lower right includes me, second from the left, uh, on this kind of field trip, uh, checking all this out. There were no detailed maps of sufficient resolution to be useful for identifying safe landing sites on the moon. So Kuiper decided it was time to assemble a lunar atlas, the best ground-based uh, photographs. As director of the Yerkes Observatory, he had access to the world's largest 40-inch refractor, but he also visited other observatories that had taken high-resolution images. When he attended the 1955 International Astronomical Union meeting in Dublin, he solicited astronomers to help with the atlas and got a response from only one person, Ewan Whitaker, a member of the lunar section of the British Astronomical Association, but was an expert at lunar features and nomenclature. Ewan visited Yerkes just after Sputnik was launched, which launched the space race. At Yerkes, they took on the job of collecting the best Earth-based images that would serve as a basis for the series of lunar atlases. These would be the first steps in identifying landing sites for human mission. In 1960, Kuiper and his small group moved to the University of Arizona and established the Lunar and Planetary Lab where the skies provided better observing conditions. Five lunar atlases were produced. The photographic atlas of the moon, the collection of the best photographic half tone images at the time was produced at, at the University of Chicago for the moon. The orthographic atlas A and B, which included a coordinate system to map the location of surface features, had two parts, A and B. And then the rectified lunar atlas, rectify the moon for shortened limb regions via rephotographing plates projected onto a white hemisphere. This allowed Bill Hartman to identify the large Orientale Basin impact. And then finally, the Consolidated Lunar Atlas. Authors Kuiper, Whitaker, Strom, Fountain, and Larson, composed of 225 fields printed on 11 by 14 photographic paper with careful dodging to optimize visibility of the painter's sunrise sunset terminator with bright highlands of the moon. 
The low sun angle films were taken with a 61 inch Kuiper telescope, while the high sun angle full moon images were taken with the US Observatory Naval Observatory 61 inch telescope in Flagstaff in unusually good seeing condition. 250 copies of the Atlas were made and distributed to major observatories and research universities. The need for high quality ground based resolution justified bit building NASA funded 61 inch telescopes sited in the Catalina Mountains near Mount Bigelow. It was designed and built for the highest resolution the atmosphere would offer. The optics were fabricated in the LPL optics shop to very high precision. First light was in October 1965. The Cassegrain design telescope had interchangeable F13.5 and F45 secondary mirrors, providing plate scales of 10 and 3 arc seconds per millimeter. The lunar films were all taken at the F45 focus. Uh, on the right, we see the completed 61 inch telescope with me at the focus with a 35 millimeter camera taking high resolution pictures of the planets. The first project with the new telescope was a consolidated lunar atlas. 8,000 five inch by seven inch films exposed from October 1965 to January of 1967 were taken using a portrait camera film holder fitted with a focal plane scroll shutter. The moon was divided into eight longitude bands. Each band had 16 to 28 fields that tracked the sunrise and sunset terminator for various sun angles. In this picture, Gerard Kuiper and Ewan Whitaker are patiently waiting uh, for the previous observer to take their instrument off. That's the camera. That's the whole camera. It just took double slide holders and a shutter. And that was it. For one solid summer, I enlarged two times the best 192 five inch by seven inch films into an 11 by 14 film that was used in producing contact prints. These contact films were dodged to bring out fainter terminator details without overexposing the brighter high sun illuminated regions. Production runs for the 260 copies were made by a local photographic studio. Further preparation for the Apollo landings came with the Rangers seven, eight, and nine, surveyor one, three, five, six, seven, and the five lunar orbiter missions. Kuiper, Whitaker, and Gene Shoemaker, creator of the astrogeology branch of the U.S. Geological Survey and Flagstaff, worked together to determine, among other things, the bearing strength of the surface. The Ranger spacecraft had cameras to take very high resolution images of the lunar surface just prior to impact. Ranger 7 provided data on surface bearing strength by measuring boulders partially buried in the regolith. These pictures from the consolidated lunar atlas shows how the uh, lot, lot, latitude swaths follow the sun. And this picture of Clavius is a particularly high resolution uh, uh, image. And uh, the blue box contains the different uh, latitude zones uh, for the user to pull out the sequence of prints that show the changing sun angle. It's the cover of the explanation to the Consolidated Lunar Atlas with uh, authors, but also on the right is the, is the example of why even from the ground these pictures were useful, and that is because the very low sun angle you could see topography much better. The top picture shows uh, the region of the Apollo 11 uh, landing site, but the bottom one is shows what the site looks like uh, near full moon and you see nothing of the topography. 
Ewan Whitaker's skill with lunar terrain paid off for Apollo 12, which as a test of precision targeting, aimed for the Surveyor 3 lander, whose position was known only approximately by telemetry. Fortunately, Ewan was able to make out features on the horizon in the Surveyor image to establish its location. This allowed the Apollo 12 astronauts to walk from the lander to the Surveyor and return a camera. So you can see the astronaut getting ready to detach the camera, the panoramic camera, and it got and brought back and is on display at the National Air and Space Museum in Washington. So this is what LPL looks like now. It's grown quite a bit, but it has been affiliated with virtually every spacecraft mission to the moon and the planets. From our planet with one large moon to the faraway planet Saturn with the most known satellites and spectacular rings, every 14 years we see Saturn in its ring plane which reduces the scattered light of the rings and allow more efficient search for small satellites. Our first opportunity with the Kuiper 61-inch telescope was in 1966, and we took many images looking for new moons, but only moderate success with very faint suggestions of a satellite just outside the edgewise rings and named Janus by the French discoverer Dolphus. We prepared for the 1980 ring plane crossing by building a focal plane chronograph. This allowed us to see the satellite Janus, suspected in the 1966 data. But as we continue to observe that night, another satellite appeared on the other side of the planet. It turns out we had discovered the first co-orbital satellites. The images on the right are examples of what uh, we were looking at with the bright disk blocked out by that uh, finger. And we watched the satellites shuttling back and forth in front of and beyond the rings. So we were able to discover another satellite. And this is where we published the results of that and of our uh, observations of the E-ring. Our observations of Epimetheus and Janus from the ground allowed calculation of their orbits with sufficient precision for Voyager 1 to image them during the Voyager flyby. When we saw the first Voyager images of Epimetheus, we were astounded to see the shadow of the F ring play across the moon. This is from points of light to worlds. These are images from Voyager 1 and Cassini, much better resolution of Epimetheus. And this is the comparison of those core of it'll Epimetheus on the left and Janus on the right. They're similar size, but they look different. <laughs> From ground-based observations during the 1980 ring plane crossing, six new satellites were discovered. With Cassini, several satellites were discovered orbiting within the bright rings. But as of today, using very large ground-based telescopes, the number of Saturn satellites is at a whopping 82, the most natural satellites of all of our planets. And the star moon of Saturn is Enceladus, source of the E-ring. We were able in 1980 to observe the E-ring in several filters and found that it is blue. After I announced the results in a meeting in 1982, the theorists calculated this could be best matched by two micron water spheres. This implied Enceladus, the source of water. Cassini flew through plumes, speeding the E-ring many times and found evidence for a subsurface global ocean with carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, ammonia, methane, placing it high on the list of possible abode for life. 
a return visit by spacecraft will be an interesting mission. This is an image from the Cassini spacecraft looking towards Saturn with the sun behind the disk, but illuminating the E-ring, which is clearly blue as we determine with our observations here, which are frozen water droplets. Our observations of the E-ring and the color has been important in defining what may be one of the best sources of water and light in the solar system. Future spacecraft will investigate and find out if that's the case. Thank you for listening.